Welcome to E380, Spring 2011-2012. I'm Andy Freeman. The other course organizer is Dennis Allison. If you're taking the class for credit, standard rant about assignments. Um, almost all 380 talks about, are about technology. However, while bad technology will probably crater your organization, good technology won't make it uh, succeed. Success actually seems to be a people issue, something we don't do a lot in 380. Today's talk by Paul Buhait is about an innovation in helping startups succeed. In broad strokes, the idea is old, but few have managed even modest success, let alone at the scale that Y Combinator seems to work. Maybe that's it. Scale is the secret in this, too. I give you Paul Buhait of Y Combinator. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. So. I find I usually like doing essentially Q&A, so I decided uh, to structure this more as I'll start off with essentially FAQ, and then partway through switch to, to your questions. Um, so how much time do we have? Until Cameras go off at 5.30, okay. but you can keep the room until 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> we'll probably finish before that. So just to get started, uh, I'll give you a little intro of my background in case you're not familiar. Um, I started at a little startup in, in uh, Palo Alto here on University Ave back in 99, uh, which was of course Google, um, and did a couple of things there, most notably Gmail. I left Google in 2006 and uh, essentially retired. It turns out retirement is boring, so I uh, started. <laughs> Yeah, started a company with some friends called FriendFeed back in uh, 2007, uh, and we were kind of early in a lot of the feed stuff that's popular now. Um, we were fairly innovative. We introduced the now ubiquitous like button, but unfortunately, we never, um, never really broke through to like the billion user mark. We we reached maybe a million users, and. Uh, Turns out we were in kind of a difficult competitive situation with Facebook, Twitter, and Google all. We were kind of in the middle of the three of them, and they were all growing very fast or, or hoping to grow very fast. So it wasn't a great competitive situation, but it was uh, a pretty good situation for selling a company. So we sold to Facebook, uh, and I think that has proven to be a pretty good decision based on where Facebook has gone since then. At the time, it was valued at $6.5 billion which I don't know where it is today. Uh, but it's more than six and a half still. Uh, and hopefully, hopefully it'll hold up there. Uh, and I was there for about a year, which was actually really interesting because having spent so much time at Google, there's, I think, um, a real risk of overgeneralizing when you're inside of a, an organization as successful as Google, going from, from say, from, from about 20 people to, to uh, maybe 5,000 when I left, it's easy to, to think that everything we did at Google was the right way, which obviously isn't true. I think probably Google did a few things that were very right and a lot of things that were just kind of random. So it was really great to be inside of Facebook and see a really a very different company that was also very successful, but in many ways did things different from Google. And so at least I have like two data points now on these, on these highly successful companies. Uh, and so I eventually left Facebook joined YC full-time as a partner there, which is what I've been doing for the last year and a half. Um, but I'd actually started investing in Y Combinator companies in 2006, around the same time I was leaving Google. So I've, I invested in, I think, probably about 40 YC companies before joining, <laughs> uh, including Eric's, <laughs> um, and, uh, and probably another 20 or 30 since then. So this is partially a YC pitch, but it's not just it's not just uh, that I'm, I'm pushing because it's my job. I actually think that it's a, a pretty effective model that we have, and that's why I'm working there. So what is YC? Uh, we bring in entrepreneurs typically. Oh, sorry, YC, Y Combinator. Um, anything to do with what? Carlos Connector Y Combinator. No, it's... it's uh, it's a computer science thing that I don't, actually don't understand. Okay, <laughs> I, I didn't name the company. Paul Graham named it. I, I I read the Wikipedia page about the actual like technical definition of the Y Combinator, but um, 
it's not it's not totally yeah yeah I mean it's like a function anyway um, yeah yeah uh, <laughs> so so what we do is is really bring in people typically at a very early stage um, sometimes they don't even have ideas which has been a little bit controversial someone um, I think it was Dustin Moskovitz recently there was some news story where he said that this no idea thing is bad for the world um, I disagree <laughs> there's there's a little bit of a, of a uh, we're sort of cheating when we say that it's an experiment because we kind of already know what the answer is. It turns out we've always had essentially a no idea track. A lot of times we get teams who apply who are very good. We think they have a lot of potential, but we just think they have bad ideas. And so we've always brought people in who essentially had no idea. Um, and many of the famous companies came in that way. Um, the most notable example, or the most the earliest example, I should say, is, is Reddit, which I think they originally applied with uh, something for ordering food from your cell phone which is a good idea now, but was a bad idea in 2006 when, when there was no iPhone. So uh, the primary uh, value of Y Combinator is not the money, but the advice that we give and the connections and the, the value of the network. So at this point, we have, I think, over 400 companies in Y Combinator. And that turns out to be a very powerful resource because very often if someone comes in and they have a problem, I, my answer is actually just to point them to another one of our Y Combinator companies because you know, if you need advice on, on split testing, we can send you to Optimizely because they specialize in how to do A-B tests. Um, and it's surprising how often that happens. The other dynamic that we get is that a lot of times the first customer will be another YC company. And especially for products that are, let's say, like a database, it can be very hard to get your first customer. You know, who wants to be like the first person to use a new database? It's kind of a uh, risky proposition. So, yeah, I mean, it gives you, it gives you essentially uh, improved access to these companies. Uh, a lot of times on demo day, the slides will be amusing because they'll list their customers, and it's basically a list of other YC companies. Um, but that's, that's a very good thing to have, and those companies have gotten a lot of value out of YC. And they also know that um, you know, the companies that are approaching them, we can give them some insight. We can, we can give some, some credibility. It isn't just a, a, a random cold call. So it, it works very well for both sides of the, of the equation. Um, but I, I think the real reason that YC is so valuable is that the startup world is very, um, it's, not, it's not a Gaussian. It's a, it's a power law, right? And so if you're a little bit off the mark, your company might be completely worthless. So the difference between a company that's worthless and a company that's, let's say, $100 billion may not be that big of a difference. You know, Facebook certainly wasn't the only social network that someone tried to build. Google wasn't the only search engine. You know, Dropbox wasn't the first time someone tried to do online file storage. A lot of times the difference between the companies that succeed and the companies that fail is um, kind of subtle. And so we've found that sometimes a relatively minor course correction can make a big difference in the success of a company. So the best example of that, in my mind, is Airbnb. They had actually launched, I think, three times before joining Y Combinator. And um, they, also, they also had been introduced to a, a variety of angels, including myself, embarrassingly enough, and, and were never able to raise any money. So no one, no one they, had, they had no users, no money, and by the time they joined, their, their only developer uh, had gone off and gotten a different job. So they were pretty much like this close to being dead uh, when, they, when they joined Y Combinator. And they got a few pieces of, of I think, really helpful advice while in Y Combinator. Um, one of them was they needed bigger pictures because <laughs> um, it turns out pictures are key when you're renting property. Um, they needed a different name. Their original name was Airbed and Breakfast, which is a little bit limiting when you think about, I don't want to stay on an airbed. Uh, and the third, the third thing that I think was really crucial is Paul Graham asked them, where are your customers? Because they did have a few users. And at the time, the only city where they had any real traction was New York. So he's, he's, he told Brian Chesky, like, go to New York, right? And talk to your users, get to know them, find out, find out what's making it work there. And so that was, uh, I think, where he spent a good portion of his time in Y Combinator is actually in New York, talking to the people, understanding what was making, 
what was making Airbnb work in New York and not other places. And then by the end of YC, they, they raised their own from Sequoia and are now like aggressively taking over the world. Their, their growth graph is incredible. But it's, it's, it, it, uh, the, the analogy that I have in mind is, is like, a, uh, uh, like an archery. You have a target across the room. And you know sometimes just a few degrees to one side or another is the difference between getting a bullseye or just completely missing the target. So we like to think we're, we're, we're getting people lined up for the bullseye. <laughs> but we never really know for sure. <laughs> but the, the, the feedback so far, the startups are all quite happy. Would you agree, Eric? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Eric's company just raised $10 million on uh, Kickstarter for, uh, for uh, the Pebble watch, smartwatch, which is incredible. I think that's going to be the new model for consumer hardware. Because hardware is one of these things where it's really hard to raise money because no one believes. Like, I, was, am I the only person who invested in your company? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> so only only a few foolish angels invested, but I, I think now that we have Kickstarter, that's a really great a really great model since you can essentially pre-sell your uh, your inventory. Um, let's see what other questions are good. All right, how do we select founders? So we do an interview, a ten minute interview, and then we fund based pretty much entirely on that ten minutes. We believe we could do it in five minutes. Um, <laughs> typically, typically, you know, like five minutes. Yeah, you get you get a pretty good sense. You get a pretty good sense for people once they're in. Um, and there's really something about the in-person interaction that's really hard to duplicate in any other way, which uh, is, I think, something that I'm afraid people are are sort of losing the the realization of the value. We were just chatting beforehand that, that not enough people show up for this class. They're all watching it on video. And I think that the people who are on video are, are probably missing out on a big part of it. There's, there's something about seeing people in person where you, that you really get a sense for who they are and what they're, what they're capable of. So we've, we usually uh, end up funding about a third of the companies that we bring in to interview. And, uh, and we've had pretty good success so far. So. We think. What's that? And the cameras are off at the end. Then you get the real question. Oh, okay. <laughs> it doesn't go out. So. Yeah, yeah. That's true. So what we look for in founders is, is what, for me, one of the number one questions is just can they communicate? So the biggest problem that I run into a lot of times is people come in and they, they pitch their thing and I have no idea what they're talking about. Um, because they, they, they just launch into something about the market. And I'll say, well, what is it that it does? And they'll be like, well, wait, first I have to tell you, and I, no, what does it do? And then they'll go off on another tangent. I'll say, well, no, what does it do? <laughs> and then they'll go off. So, so if, I, if I have to ask the same question five times, that's usually uh, a really bad sign about the company. The, the, the people who are really good, the entrepreneurs who, who are really solid, typically are able to answer questions very quickly. Uh, very concisely, very clearly, and they don't want to just go on about something about the market or, oh, I read something on the internet somewhere. Uh, so so that's, a lot of it is really just communication. And I think it's maybe something that a lot of people don't appreciate the value of. And even worse, I think that people have picked up bad habits sometimes from large institutions. Like if you're working at a big company, it seems like there must be some value in giving really um, incomprehensible draw out answers. <laughs> they, they almost seem to have learned a resistance to, to giving, giving good answers. So the other thing I want to see is, is do they have vision? Um, and this is a really ambiguous thing, but the, the question in my mind when, when someone comes to me is like, do you actually see this for yourself or are you just repeating what someone else told you? Like if I say, why does someone want this? I, I'd like to know that you've actually found some really direct evidence that the thing you're building is actually useful to someone. And too often, if someone says, oh, I read an article somewhere that you know, on TechCrunch it said this is a trend. Right, that's not, that's not evidence of anything. I, I want to know, like, I'm already selling it is the best thing. Like, I already, I, I already, I've already sold copies. People have given me money. That's the best evidence. It's like, I've got to check. And I was like, all right, you're funded. Um, because the most common thing that kills startups is they build something that nobody wants. And um, 
people who are resistant to disproving their own ideas are, are usually not good founders. If you're, if you're a good founder, you have an idea and you find some way of essentially undermining your own idea. You, you, you do the thing that's, that proves that, that people will either want it or not want it. And I think that also is how you distinguish between a visionary and a, someone who's simply delusional. Is someone who's delusional will always have some excuse for why they haven't, they haven't tested their idea or, or, or proven up their idea. Uh, oh, another good question that people talk about a lot is how are startups valued? Because this seems to be very controversial. Um, and I, I think the easiest explanation is to say what is the percent uh, what is the probability that this company is going to be worth a hundred billion dollars <laughs> and and that's and if that number is too small you can ask what is the probability that this company is going to be worth 10 billion or 1 billion or god forbid a hundred million uh, and if if all of those numbers are too small then it's probably not a good investment for us it may be a good business it may be you know like a, a sandwich shop could be a good business but it's not a good investment for Y Combinator it's not something that, that's going to attract uh, venture capital. So we're, we're looking for things that have that, that potential to be really huge. And it could be a really a long shot, but again, if a company has, let's say, a 1% chance of being worth $100 billion, that's still you know, expected value somewhere in the range of a billion dollars, which is pretty good. It's still cool. Um, <laughs> so that, of course, leaves the question of how do we know what the chance of the company being worth $100 billion is. And that's just a simple matter of predicting the future. Uh, all right, I've got one more, one more question. Is, should I work at a big company? One of, the, one of the things I hear a lot of times is people, people say, oh, I'm just going to go work at Google for a few years or, or whatever to, to, to learn the ropes, and then I'm going to go start a company. And the thing that we've noticed is the longer you spend at a big company, the worse entrepreneur you are. It, it seems to actually cause some sort of um, perhaps brain damage. And I, <laughs> and I think the reason for this is that it essentially sets all of your little default, your, your, your reflexes are trained wrong. When you're in a big company, you learn to avoid problems. You know, if, if for example, you launch a product and it's so popular that the whole thing collapses. <laughs> in a big company, that's very embarrassing. In a startup, people start throwing money at you when that happens. So a lot of times, if you find a startup, if you have a startup founder and you say, like, why haven't you launched yet? And they're saying, oh, well, we're kind of worried about this thing or that thing. We're not sure if we have enough capacity. Pretty much guaranteed that founder spent time at a big company and they've become afraid of success. It's, really, it's, the, it's, a, it's the really toxic thing to be scared that you're going to be successful. And it causes, it causes all of these little decisions where you become more cautious. Um, and that's, that's a very bad thing, to, a very bad reflex to have in a market where all of the money is made by a few outliers. So it's all about making yourself an outlier. The, uh, in the startup business, essentially all of the money is made by the top 1% of companies. And, uh, you know, it's not an evil conspiracy. It's just a, a uh, it's just the dynamics of the market is that it's, it tends to be a winner take all, you know. There's all these other social networks that just sank beneath the waves and they didn't make, an, make a lot of money. And so as an investor, you're always looking to say, like, is this a company that could be that top 1%? So in the case of Y Combinator, from the first 200 companies that we funded, the number one company at current valuations is Dropbox. And it's worth more than the next 199 combined. <laughs> so essentially, the only thing that matters from a return perspective is that we invested in Dropbox. The number two company, Airbnb, is worth more than the next 198 combined. <laughs> and, and once you internalize that dynamic, you can start to see why it becomes, why people are so willing to take chances on a company that could be, or that will most likely fail, right? Is because if you have had just a 1% chance of being the next Dropbox, I should invest, right? Like a 1% chance of being Dropbox is a great investment. Uh, a 0% chance of being Dropbox is not a great investment, even if it has like a 100% chance of being, you know, worth a few million dollars. Uh,
Another fun topic that I, I've noticed floating around is, is Facebook killing Silicon Valley? There was some article the other day that said that um, somehow Facebook is killing Silicon Valley because we're building social networks instead of like rocket ships. Um, yeah, Steve Blank. I, I, I don't really understand this idea. I, I think uh, the, thing, the reason people aren't building rocket ships is because, or, or a lot of these other huge ideas that we would love to see happen, is, is a lot of times those are just very difficult investments. You know, it takes a, it takes a lot of money, um, and in many cases you run into, uh, you'll run into a lot of legal or regulation or whatever issues. That's, that's I think, what keeps people from investing. It isn't because someone is investing in Facebook. There's essentially a surplus of capital in the world. It isn't either or. I think, I think people can fund all of the startups that are viable. So when asking why something isn't getting funded, typically the answer is because no one believes that it's a good investment. And they may well be wrong, but it isn't because of Facebook. It isn't because we're investing in these other things that we aren't investing in, uh, in rocket ships. Um, and there's a couple of trends I've, I've identified, in case you're interested in trends. Um, the one thing I've, I've, I mentioned a little bit earlier is just the increase in leverage brought about by technology. So the really great example that's come up recently is when Instagram was acquired for a billion dollars, they had 13 employees, which is pretty incredible. I, I doubt that there's ever been a billion dollar company with only 13 employees. But this is only possible because of what's happened in the past few years where you have Amazon, you have all these different services, you have the iPhone, you have the App Store. And all of the peripheral work that's required to, to start a company is becoming a commodity that you can buy. So you don't need to hire all those people anymore. And what this means is that the ability of an exceptional or a handful of exceptional individuals to do something really big has become uh, greater than ever. So this also applies, I think, to, to people and to hiring. So there's this question of, like, is a good engineer worth Sometimes people say a good engineer is worth 100 times or 100 times more productive than, a, than a, an average engineer. And I think that is kind of a, a, an underestimate. And the example I, that came to mind is uh, Jeff Dean at Google. Right? He's, he's pretty famous for a number of things, such as uh, MapReduce or GFS. And so the question I had in my mind is, how many average engineers would it take to replace Jeff Dean? And of course, the answer is like infinity. <laughs> right? It's simply not possible. Like no, no, no number of, of average programmers could ever produce what he did. And, and so in that case, it, he's actually infinitely more productive than an average engineer. That's something Fred Turman said. What's that? Fred Turman said, no number of six foot high jumpers will ever equal a seven foot jumper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but of course, on the other hand, if what you're looking for is not someone it's to. I would log going. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Again, and so, and so this is this, the same reason why I think the companies that are most successful are the ones that are able to attract these, these, really ex these outliers, the people like Jeff Dean. Because you, can't, you just can't replace him with an army of, of, of um, enterprise Java developers. But on the other hand, if what you're looking for is to do a bunch of enterprise Java development, you're probably better with those people because I think someone like Jeff Dean would just quit. So in that case, no number of Jeff Deans would replace the average engineer. Um, I think there's another, another interesting trend, which is that the startups that we're seeing now, it isn't, it isn't so much commercialization of some technology that came out of a research lab. I think it's the combination of technology with something else, something a little bit more um, essentially right brain. I, I think the big successes we're seeing, it's a combination left brain, right brain thing, where people bring together technology and something else. Like the real magic of Facebook is not, is not in the algorithms. It isn't that they found some more efficient way to store the social graph. What they did was combine technology with essentially psychology. Is they figured out how to create a place th where a billion people come together and, and like don't kill each other. <laughs> right? it's, it's a town square that fits a billion people, which is incredible from a, from a psychology standpoint. And I think that's where the real breakthrough is there. And the same thing goes for a company like uh, Airbnb. Again, there's, not, there's, there's obviously a lot of technology challenges in scaling a business like that. But it wasn't, it wasn't a technology breakthrough that was required for that. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that, where a lot of the big companies, what you're really taking is technology plus something a little more abstract, something a little bit more intuitive. Uh, or even Apple, for that matter. I mean, it isn't. 
isn't the technology that necessarily makes the iPhone great. It's the combination of the technology, the design, the, the business ecosystem. It's putting all of the pieces together. So the people who are going to start those companies are people who have a more, um, a more global view of things, people who can understand all the pieces and how they all fit together, and who are able to, to go beyond simply like, I know algorithms or, or whatever it may be. Um, and one last trend is essentially that founders are becoming much more powerful than they used to be. And I like to think Y Combinator is a big part of this. Uh, historically, there was a huge power asymmetry between venture capitalists and founders because founders were typically first-time founders and venture capitalists do it over and over again. So, so one of them is very inexperienced and the other one is, is um, you know, knows all the players, knows all the tricks. And that dynamic has completely changed. Um, one of the benefits of being in Y Combinator is investors are required to treat you well because they know that if they, if they screw over a YC company, um, it may be the last YC company they ever deal with because that knowledge is going to spread through the network very quickly. And consequently, we're seeing the terms evolve at a very rapid rate. Uh, in the most recent batch, we had a number of companies raising like four and five million dollar seed rounds, <laughs> not giving up any board seats, having minimal dilution. I mean, these things would never have happened just a few years ago. Um, and you could say that maybe it's a sign of a bubble, but I, I think really what it is in this case is, is just that a lot of power is shifting towards the founders because it turns out it's the founders that make these companies successful. Uh, and with that, um, I'd like to just take some questions from, from the audience. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear more about YC's experience with hardware companies and any advice you might have uh, in addition to obviously how uh, so, do I, I, do I need to repeat the questions or for the, this thing? Yes. All right, the question is advice for hardware startups in the Valley. So uh, are you thinking more consumer or? Yeah. So I, I think for consumer, <laughs> honestly, I, I think the Pebble model is going to be the one to go with because consumer things are, are especially hard to, to prove out. Consumers are a little bit hard to predict. Right? Nobody seems to know which things are going to take off. Nobody predicted uh, that the Pebble watch is going to sell 10 million. Um, and so I, I think that that might really be the model of the future, is essentially that you pre-sell. In general, pre if you can pre-sell your product, that's always the way to go, even if you're, um, especially if you're in the enterprise space, right? you should go sell the product. Because one of the things that happens a lot of times is you go talk to people and you say, oh, I'm going to build this. Is it a good idea? And they're like, oh, yeah, that's great. We'd love to have that. That would solve a problem. And then you say, all right, well, um, maybe you can sign a purchase order. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the interest evaporates. Because if you just ask people for their opinions, a lot of times they'll just give you some enthusiasm. But there's no, there's no commitment on their part. So the, the thing to do is, is really get as much commitment as you can out of your customers, uh, whether it's, whether it's um, enterprise or consumers. Um, if you can actually sell the product before you build it, you're in a much stronger position, both in terms of knowing that you're actually building the right product, um, because if people will already pay for it before it exists, that's a good, that's a good sign. Uh, and it's also very helpful just in terms of fundraising, because if you can go to, a, to an investor and actually show them the list of orders, that's going to be a lot more compelling than just a pitch where you say, oh, I built this thing and I'm sure everyone wants it. right? I was interested in how you said that a, a company that's worth the several millions is not a good investment. Right. Is that just because of the waste of time or? Uh, OK, so the question is, why are we not interested in companies that are worth a couple of million dollars? I mean, I understand, like, yeah. definitely, like, a bigger outcome is much better. But yeah. that was a bad investment. Well, it, it's bad in terms of um, just expected returns, right? <laughs> so, so we take 7% equity as part of the program, so 7% of you know, a million dollars isn't, isn't a huge amount versus, you know, a chance at, if it's a 1% chance of being a $100 billion company, that means the expected value is, is of, the, of that company, your expected value is like a billion dollars. But if it's just going to be worth a million, you know, that's a factor of a thousand difference, right? And yeah, we, we have limited resources, obviously. There's only, um, I always forget how many partners we have. It depends how you count. But you know, let's say we have six full-time partners. 
uh, the time that we would spend dealing with, let's say, a, a profitable sandwich shop um, is time that would have been better spent on a potential Dropbox. So it really just comes down to limited resources. And it's not to say that those aren't great businesses. This is the thing that I think, uh, especially on Hacker News, I, I, I've seen more and more of these kind of bitter comments from people who I think are essentially running a little one-man ISV where they get really upset that they see you know, Instagram sell for a billion dollars. And they say, how could that possibly be worth a billion dollars? You know, my company isn't worth a billion dollars. But of course, the, those people aren't working on something that has the potential to be worth that much. Um, and it doesn't mean it's a bad business. It just means it's not the right business. It's not the right fit for us. So, so you, uh, you talk about your companies will be formed by com uh, people who have left brain, right brain skills. Mm -hmm. And YC has been typically kind of two technical founders. Uh, very, very strong technical, and you believe that you can teach them the business. Right. Uh, I think in the last batch, Olga was the first non-technical founder to be funded alone. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think about business founders in general? Uh, has their value increased, or uh, and designer founders as well? So the question is, has the value of business and designer founders increased? Um, I, I think quite possibly that that's true. So the example you gave was Olga. Um, we f funded her because she just seems like she's going to take over the world. Uh, and this is uh, Shop Teeks is the company. Um, and and sh part of what was impressive is she's not technical, but she'd already built the site. She just, she, she f wasn't sitting there waiting to, to just have someone come along and do it for her. She, you know, it would have been great if she was a hacker, but she didn't let that stand in the way. Right, you run into some of these people who they, do, they sit there you know, building their plans and they're like, oh, now I just need to hire someone to implement this thing. And they don't, they don't get that that's not really how it works. Um, and actually, that's also a great example of where we've really helped her out because we um, introduced her to founders from a previous batch uh, of a company called, the original company was called Anyvite, it's the Marin brothers. Um, and they ended up joining her as co-founders. So now there's three founders on that team. Um, but that's kind of an exceptional case where she is just obviously such a forceful and essentially unstoppable person. <laughs> you just don't, <laughs> if you meet someone who's unstoppable, you want to fund them because you're afraid not to, right? It's like they're going to be successful whether you, whether you help them out or not, so you, you, you may as well do it. Uh, the other thing you mentioned is designers. So Airbnb is a good example. I, I, think, uh, I think Joe and Brian both went to the Rhode Island School of Design. They were actually designers. And then they had one, one hacker. So when it comes down to the technology on these companies, you basically need enough. And I think there's a mistake, though, in thinking that just because someone is technical, that they don't have the other skills. Right? The optimal, the ideal founder is someone who can do everything. Right? Someone who combines it all. And I, and I think that it isn't that people are either left brain or right brain. I think what happens, unfortunately, a lot of times is that maybe one aspect of their personality develops first. So let's say at a very early age, you're like good at math. People say, oh, you're really good at math. You should focus on that. And you start believing, oh, maybe I'm not good at these other skills. But it might just be that you got one skill before you got the other. So people, I think, are perfectly capable of being very solid in both kind of the right brain and the left brain way. And that's what I like to see is people who who have that complete personality. Mm -hmm. It sounds very much that uh, you seem to find personalities and you make an assessment as if you are um, the person you talk to rather than technology. Mm -hmm. So does it happen that you assess the technology and if so, what are the things you look for? So the question is, we are. it looks like we're looking for people and not technology. And that's... Um, I mean, in your assessment, that's... What you, what I've heard in your talk, it sounds yes. like, like this, you look for the entrepreneur, um, potential, um, creative, and so on, rather than existing technology and ideas. But now the question is, let's assume someone is approaching you with an idea. Mm -hmm. Do you actually? How do you assess it? How do we assess the idea? <laughs> um, really, it, it. You're right. We really do just fund entrepreneurs. We. Um, the thing is that if someone comes in with a bad idea, they can change the idea, but if they come in with a bad founder, we can't change the founder. So ideas can be fixed, founders, um, I mean, we fix people to some extent, we can help them. Uh, and actually that's one of the most amazing things, and things I really love so much about YC, is watching the transition of founders from the beginning of the program to the end. It's actually really incredible, the, the, 
the changes that can occur. So I don't want to make it seem like you are you just stuck the way you are. People evolve um, to an incredible extent. The the change that happens from from the beginning of YC to demo day is is often just really remarkable. And again, that comes from the group. Uh, they're all watching each other, all learning from each other. Um, we also bring in speakers where they can meet successful entrepreneurs, and you kind of you know monkey see monkey do. We kind of can pick up on how other people work. Um, actually, that reminds me. So apparently, uh, people often don't show up for this talk, and I think. Did I mention this already? I think it's a mistake. I think there's a real value in seeing people in person. There's something about actually meeting someone in person that's that's very powerful. So, um, so yeah, it really is all about the founders. Um, have you scaled Y Combinator, in particular, like as the class size continues to grow? Um, how do you manage like overlapping businesses that could potentially be children? Okay, so there's two questions. How do we scale Y Combinator? And secondly, how do we handle conflicts, right? So um, I'll answer the second one first because it's easier. It, it, we actually have surprisingly few conflicts. And, I, and sometimes one class we actually had three companies come in all doing the same idea. So that seemed like it was going to be a really problematic thing that we had three companies all pursuing the same idea. But very quickly um, what happened is they ended up moving in different directions and none of them ended up competing with each other. So the companies evolved pretty fast, and um, just I think as a general principle, the the space of ideas is so large um, that it's more advantageous for people to kind of differentiate anyway. Like if there's already someone really promising working on an idea, it's probably not the right thing for you to go after. Um, but if we did have a conflict, I mean we're just careful not to reveal anything <laughs> that the other one tells us. Um, but it, it, it surprisingly, with 400 companies, it still hasn't been a problem. And um, I anticipate it, it really won't be. Uh, the other question is, how do we scale YC? And the answer is, uh, a little bit at a time. You know, each time, each time, each batch is a little bit bigger than the one before, and, and, and typically we'll run into some problem and we solve it. It's just like scaling a, a web service or whatever it is. You, 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 you have a problem, you fix it. Um, and we've come up with a number of kind of innovative solutions like we just recently introduced this concept of group office hours where we'll bring in companies seven or eight at a time and we, we do office hours with them all at the same time which has proven to be actually really interesting because it means that the companies get to know each other better because uh, one of the things that kind of breaks down as it gets bigger is the companies just don't don't have that level of interaction so they get more insight into each other's business and then they end up learning a lot from each other as well because a lot of times, you know, one of them will say, oh, I have this issue. And half the time, the, the answer comes from one of the other companies in that, in that group. Um, but overall, yeah, we don't, we, don't know what the, we don't know what it will be like to have 500 companies in a batch. There's, there's a few obvious breaking points. Um, I think the most difficult might be uh, Demo Day. <laughs> when, when Demo Day becomes Demo Week, I don't know what's going to happen. That, that's going to be a challenge. But everything else seems to scale really well. And especially since a lot of the value of YC is actually in the, the network itself, the value seems to be increasing as it gets bigger. So it's actually becoming more valuable. Um, and it also just means that we have more experience. Right? The more startups we fund, the more insight we have into all the different problems. You know, Like if you're doing something with consumer hardware, we can send you to Eric. Or whatever it is, we, we, have, we have a much more fine-grained knowledge. And we've seen a lot more things go wrong. Uh, one of the things that's happened recently that's kind of interesting is that we've realized that we can predict a lot of the problems in terms of which companies are going to fall apart. <laughs> we, we know even at funding which, which founders won't be there by the end a lot of times because you can just see the dynamics between them and we, we can just tell like, okay, this guy isn't going to be with the team for long. <laughs> that you, you kind of pick up on maybe two, if it's like a three-person team, maybe one of the people doesn't really belong. Um, and a lot of that just comes from the experience. Capital. Yeah, our, our job is kind of strange in that it, it involves a little bit of everything. There is, to some extent, marriage counseling. Like, probably 10% of the companies that come into YC will lose a founder, a co-founder, by demo day. It's a, starting a company is very stressful. Um, possibly more so than, than marriage in many cases because these people are actually together in many cases almost like 24-7 
they're dealing with very stressful issues, um, and inevitably, some fraction of them end up uh, hating like each other. <laughs> What's that? It's more like the military. Yeah, possibly. Uh, but there's there's not You're quite. On the fire, you know? Yeah, yeah. There's not the same level of uh, top-down thing because each of the companies are, are free to go their own direction. So. Mm -hmm. For C grounds and doing convertible notes, what percentage of those contracts usually have caps, and what is why combinators didn't cap on, on a convertible note? So the question is, what is our opinion? What percentage of C grounds have caps on the convertible notes, and what is our opinion on caps? I don't know what percentage it is. I would, well, okay. now with the start fund, all of the companies get an uncapped convertible note at the beginning. So 100% start out uncapped. Uh, but typically, as, the, as fundraising progresses, there, a, a cap comes in. And the, there's a most favored nation clause in that convertible note so that the previous uncapped ones inherit that cap. Uh, in general, I think caps are a good idea. I, I think like, Doing an entire round uncapped is a very strange um, phenomenon. Like there, there, there should be a value assigned to a company, right? When you invest, there should be some price attached. But that said, occasionally you get a company that's that's just so hot that people are, are essentially throwing money at it. We had one last summer that uh, ended up turning down money from Ashton Kutcher on an uncapped convertible note <laughs> because they just said we have too much money. Right, like it seems like a preposterous thing, but they, there were so many people who wanted to invest that they, they essentially just ran out of room. They didn't want to take so much that, you know, when they did eventually convert the notes, that they would be over diluted. So it really just depends on the company. But the the thing that we really try to get through to the companies and are only moderately successful with is that fundraising is not success. And it's really hard because they all get so into it that, and there are all these like really competitive people. <laughs> and they see the other company, oh, those guys raised at a tw 12 million, I need to get at least 12 million, but you know, it doesn't matter what you raise at, it, it's not, that's not success, right? Like, I think Airbnb's first round was like at a 3 million or something, something really low, right? What matters is, is, is that you, you build a successful company. So we really try to reinforce that. You know, fundraising is just a step, so you just have to do good enough. You have to get enough money to make a successful company. You need to do at a good enough valuation that you haven't given up too much control. Um, and beyond that, it, you, you may be wasting your time on over-optimizing that, that stuff. Thank you. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. So, um, earlier you were saying, with Wall Street Black, you know, Facebook is still in value. Yeah. It's probably harmful to some extent, but there's still a point to be made with respect to VCs, sort of CA, and social and all and so forth, being much, much better investment than clean tech and biotech. Yeah. Well, that, and that in itself is sort of <laughs> taking away some of the capital to innovate in those sectors and putting it into something that's, you know, that's at least not pushing the envelope as far with respect to science. So will there ever be sort of a, uh, maybe like a shot back at Steve Blank from, you know, from YC saying, that, well, we're going to start investing into companies that are not so much into software or e-commerce and so forth. Mm -hmm. We're actually doing like really, really hard scientific problems. And, I, I guess sort of the counter argument to that, maybe real quick, is that well, there might not be very good business, but is it something that you guys have ever considered, like invest in like a battery company, invest in like you know, sort of like straight out the lab, they prove right. the concept, how they need to scale it. So the question is, would we ever invest in like a battery company? Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, absolutely. If, if it seemed like a good business, we we interview a pretty wide variety of companies. Um, we fund some outliers. I mean, you, you hear a lot about some of the social companies because um, you know those are the ones that get the most press. So I, I think there's actually a skewed perception of what it is that we even fund, just because the companies that people talk about the most tend to be like consumer internet companies, right? If it's on your iPhone, there's a greater presence than in people's minds than if it's some sort of obscure technology. Like in the previous batch, we have a company called Provices, which does software-defined radio. Which is a very interesting technology, and, and their technology is, according to the founder, like two generations ahead of everyone else doing software to find radio. He has this device that he's selling for, I think, six hundred sixty-six dollars. A little nod to the Apple one that that goes from uh, zero to four gigahertz um, 
so you know DC to four gigahertz, and can decode essentially you know any kind of signal and, and do multiple. You know, can do cell phone and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and everything all at the same time. It's a really fascinating device, but you don't really hear about that, right? Um, and there's a, there's a lot of companies like that. We have a couple of. I, I don't want to pre pre announce obviously any of the companies. That's the other the other dynamic is that a lot of times the companies that are doing things that are a little bit further out there um, take longer to launch. So we don't talk about them until they've publicly launched. But we have some other companies that are a little bit more hard technology that takes longer to develop. Um, and so you're not going to hear about them as soon as like uh, an iPhone app, for example, which someone can turn around really quickly. But again, I think the real dynamic is not that the iPhone apps are taking capital away from the other companies. I think the issue is just that people don't think the other companies, like a battery company, may not be a great investment. Um, you know, you're going to be competing with a like, Chinese battery company or something, right? But I would, love, I would love to have great investments in those other spaces. It certainly isn't lack of desire. What's the percentage of your companies that eventually earn money? That eventually what? Uh, earn money. Earn money? Make a profit. Oh, what percentage end up profitable? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a very difficult question to answer because a lot of our companies are, are quite young. Um, the nature of a high growth company is that you essentially put all of your resources into growing early on because you want, it, it, it's the growth that's most valuable. So you're not, they're not even seeking to be profitable early on. Um, so we won't really be able to answer that for a long time, but our expectation is that the vast majority of our companies will either go out of business or be acquired, just because that's the dynamics of, of the game. Um, but certainly uh, there are a lot that, that are profitable, and again, you don't hear about them as much. Um, Wufu is one example. That, that was actually the very first company I invested in, in, um, in the winter 2006 batch of Y Combinator. And they, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward business. It's like a form filler on the web, um, but they were making very good money, uh, and then they sold to <coughs> Survey Monkey last year, um, which is actually a really good exit. So they're both profitable and and had a, a nice exit. Um, but there's a lot of other companies out there that are profitable, but it isn't it isn't the number one priorities in the same way that it would be for a sandwich shop. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, seven percent. You guys do a lot of cool stuff, but seven percent is still like a pretty big chunk. What right. kind of companies do you suggest like go through my combinator? What kind of companies? So just like not through Y Combinator. So 7% is a lot. What companies do we suggest go through Y Combinator and which ones shouldn't go through Y Combinator? What's like, what kind of bigger benefit? Um, okay, who has the biggest benefit? <laughs> I, it, it's, very, it's very hard to tell, but the thing that we've found is that the companies, especially the, the top companies, have all been very satisfied with the experience. Um, the and we see repeat entrepreneurs. Justin Khan um, was from the very first batch. Uh, he started a company called Kiko with Emmett Shear. Um, that didn't really work out, but then they did uh, the following year, Justin TV, which they've grown. Um, I believe it's profitable. They, and, and then that has turned into Twitch TV, which is growing nicely. They spun out Social Cam, which was in the last YC batch. And now Justin um, started a new company called Exec that I think is going to be huge, and he did Y Combinator again. And so I think the fact that our, the top, the most successful entrepreneurs from Y Combinator uh, are coming back and doing Y Combinator again is probably the strongest endorsement the there value is. Value? What's that? What's the value add? <coughs> the, the same as the value add coming in is, is again, connections, advice, uh, just being part of the network, part of the, the brand. So the the, the kind of almost binary nature of success in startups, the thing where you either, you know, like a 1% chance of being extremely successful and a, and a high chance of being not so successful, um, means that it's in your interest to do whatever it takes to become part of that 1% of companies that's incredibly successful. So generally speaking, if, a, if we can't add, make your company more than 7% more valuable, then we're probably not a good fit, right? Uh, but so far, I, I think that we have a pretty good record. And, and it, obviously, it's not something you can prove because we can't do like a double-blind experiment or something like that. But, but again, I think just 
the strongest evidence is the fact that the best entrepreneurs are coming back and doing it again. Uh, do you have a formula to determine if your idea or concept is or the concept you're looking at will be $100 billion businesses? So, so something you look at or, or analyze to determine that? So do we have a formula for whether it has the potential to be huge? Um, the answer is obviously there's no formula that we can really do. What you can, of course, do is look at essentially the market. Um, the problem with that is that nobody knows what the market is half the time, right? Like when Apple started, was it clear that there was a, you know, half trillion dollar market for computers, personal computers, right? It, it, it takes a lot of vision and that's why, that's why I think having visionary founders is so important is because the visionary founders are able to see the market sometimes before, before it's even apparent to anyone else. Um, which leads to kind of an intriguing situation which is that I think a lot of times the best ideas are the ones that look like bad ideas. So if it looks like, if it's obvious to everyone that it's a good idea, I think it's not. If everyone thinks something's a good idea, it's actually not a good idea because um, probably a lot of people have already tried it. There must be some reason it's not a good idea. The good ideas are the ones that look like bad ideas. Um, unfortunately, the bad ideas also look like bad ideas. <laughs> so, there's a, and that's, that's where you need the visionary founders to distinguish between the bad idea that looks like a bad idea and the good idea that looks like a bad idea. Uh, but it, it really comes down to a lot of times intuition and again if you can find some sort of uh, proxy for demand is one of the big things we want to see is is if whatever you're doing is is really important or really valuable to people they should already be doing it in some really painful and inefficient way because you want the new product or the new solution to be like 10 times better than whatever it is people are already doing so one of the big um, traps that people fall into is they'll come up with something that's like 10% better than the current solution. And that's not a company. You can't build something new that's 10% better. You need to be typically an order of magnitude better. So, mm -hmm. um, Certain companies, well, this is sort of combined with the previous question, certain companies will need a certain amount of capital to really get off the ground. Um, <clears throat> do you guys typically, do you ever reject people where even your funding would not be enough capital for any for them to really start, or wherever is that ever a consideration of how much capital would be required to So the question is, do we reject companies because they require more capital than we can give them? Yeah, I mean, software companies, people using Amazon, that's, yeah. that's one thing, but a hardware and uh, some other things like exec probably has some more capital requirements. Right. Um, so the answer is, is no. I mean, we assume that essentially all of our successful companies will need to raise more. We only give people $17,000 roughly, which is um, thought to be enough to survive for three months. <laughs> so it's not, and, and then they get the 150 k from the, from the start fund now as well. But, but no, we don't, the, the question that we ask is, is not, can we give you enough money? Because the answer is almost always no. The question is, can anyone give you enough money? Right. If you if you're gonna need like a trillion dollars to execute on your plan, um, you might need a, to scale back a little bit. Um, but generally speaking, uh, you know, there's no reason any of the big companies that are out there could have could have come through Y Combinator because typically, you know, what what we're getting you ready for is a lot of times just that next stage in fundraising. You know, you've somehow proven out your idea to the greatest extent possible. Um, so that you can raise that money, because if you're if you're going to go out and ask a, a venture capital company to invest, let's say, a hundred million dollars, you better have some evidence <laughs> that they're going to get the money back, right? Uh, and, and so what we want is basically for people to prove their ideas as much as possible. So one of the big things we do is push people to launch, or at least launch a test version. Like a lot of times, to test an idea, you don't even need to write any software. One of the most common things is again, people are. Let's say you're a hacker, your default response is, oh, I'm going to build this product. But a lot of times building the product isn't the right thing to do. You can oftentimes launch something just by pretending that you have the product. Or you go tell people, I have this product, and then you try to sell them on it. And 90% um, you know, of the time you find out that your idea isn't even worth pursuing. So we, we, we push people to test their ideas as, and prove their ideas as, as fast as possible. So sometimes like, they might not be able to launch, but before the second next round that you have them 
for ten launch, I guess. Then. Absolutely. I mean, whatever. It depends on the product and how much you can pretend launch things. But almost everything is pretend launchable in some form, or, or testable in some form, or you know, fakeable in some form. Like, uh, you know, you don't need you don't need to, to build a whole a whole system to test out a lot of these ideas. You can you can fake them with people a lot of times. Like, you know, if you have some algorithm for matching matching things up that you need at scale. You, at, at, at a small scale, you can just do it manually. Like with Airbnb, they have a whole network, a uh, global network of photographers. So when you list your property on Airbnb, they'll actually send a photographer to go um, to go take pictures of your apartment, but or your house or whatever it is. But um, you know, they didn't need to spend any time developing that that network of photographers early on. Brian Chesky would go to your house. The founder would go to your house and take pictures for you, right? And obviously that's not the scalable solution long term, but it only has to be good enough for today. And that got them far enough to where they could then hire people or build a whole network of independent photographers. Are there any trends that you're seeing in the tools used by developers, with languages, databases, and uh, stacks? So what are the trends we're seeing in development? Yeah, absolutely. There's, um, I mean, the JavaScript is still on the rise, Node.js. I mean, I think it's a, a lot of the same things you, you read about out there. The MongoDB, Redis. Um, I don't think there's anything too surprising. It's, it's generally whatever it is that allows people to ship faster is the, the key. So anything that has big, long development cycles or, or whatever is going to slow them down is, is uh, not favored. I don't think we have too many people writing websites in C++. Um, it's all you know, Python or Ruby or JavaScript. Thing, things that enable people to move fast is, is basically the answer. Other than Y Combinator, which incubator do you have the most respect for? Other than Y Combinator, what incubator do I have the most respect for? <laughs> uh, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Given that a wife's secret is one. Uh, so, remember I said that all of the money is made by the top 1%? We believe that we're getting the top 1%. So if it's not part of YC, um, I, I, honestly, I'm, I'm skeptical. Um, Same distribution is true for VC firms. Ten of them make money. Yeah, it, it's actually, I think, maybe even thousands worse. thousands of them, so how right. many incubators are there? Yeah, it's true. It, v VCs have the same thing. There's only a few VC firms that make money. Most of them don't. It's actually worse in this case, I think, because a VC firm uh, funds like a handful of companies each year. We're funding hundreds of companies each year, so we, we grab a pretty big chunk. That's not to say the companies that don't get in are all bad. Um, there's, there's um, you know, sometimes we make a mistake. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, the, the, the most prominent example is we missed out on SendGrid, which is a fairly successful company. It got in the interview or in the um, application review process. Uh, it got um, kind of tossed aside because the, the the reviewer thought that it was a spam company, so it was, it was just an error in, in classification. Uh, but that's that's by far the biggest miss that we've had so far. Um, but in terms of who's number two, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious if you look out there that that TechStars, you know, is is funding a lot of companies and, and some of them are raising money, um, and I'm sure that there'll be some some reasonable businesses that come out of that, but. I certainly hope that uh, the next Google or Facebook is, is from YC and not one of the others. Because <laughs> if it goes to one of the others, that means we failed in a big way. Mm -hmm. Do you do any kind of pro bono investing? And I'll uh, explain what that is. So let's say you had something like a Wikipedia. Yeah. Right? Wikipedia is certainly something that's very valuable to the world. It's very useful, very important. But at the same time, it is a company that you wouldn't want somebody owning, and you, it's, it's a company that you wouldn't want uh, the incentives misaligned with anything with, and that's why it's not for profit, right? So along those lines, if you had something else that was, you know, you perceive to be equally valuable for the world and everything, would you, uh, you know, invest in it to the extent where it could benefit from the white combinator network, which is certainly valuable and can help it get to that stage where it's valuable for the world, and it's not just about the bottom line, right? So the question is, would we? F Fund nonprofits, basically. Well, um, it's okay. Not primarily for profit. Yeah. How about that? 
but profit isn't the primary incentive. Wikipedia could potentially make yeah. money with Mark. You don't so, profit. I don't think that we would fund a non-profit, but I, I dispute the notion that all the companies we fund are primarily motivated by profit. I think a lot of times the most successful companies are the ones that are motivated by something other than profit. I mean, I, I think the thing that keeps, that drives, you know, Larry Page or Mark Zuckerberg is not just, they're not just driven by the dollars. The dollars are there to enable the vision, right? I mean, you look at Google, like, a lot of the things people can't make sense of it, and they come up with these, like, weird conspiracy theories where they're like, well, I think they're making self-driving cars so that people will have more time to look at advertisements. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that's the reason. I think they're building self-driving cars because it's awesome, right? They're, they're, they're people, <laughs> I think the real thing is just that a lot of these founders are, are just, you know, they're people who dream of inventing great things. And a company is actually a really great way to do that, a for-profit company, because when you have billions of dollars flowing into your, into your organization, you can fund all kinds of crazy things, right? No, and I agree with that. I mean, certainly Google is doing a lot of good things, and so are a lot of other companies, right? But Wikipedia in particular is something that you wouldn't want owned by anybody. I, I, so I disagree. I mean, I, I, I would love to fund a Wikipedia competitor. Mm -hmm. I think Wikipedia is, is broken. I, I don't, I mean, Wikipedia is okay, but it has these really weird degenerative properties. Like, um, the Y Combinator page on Wikipedia, if you look at the edit history, it gets progressively worse. The article is actually getting worse with time because the editors, there's this weird deletionist culture. Uh, like your competitors are trying to... What's that? Your oh, competitors maybe, yeah. getting in there and trying to... I don't think it's our competitors who are editing it. I think it's just there's a weird culture on Wikipedia. Um, yeah. Where, where, you know, like when, when uh, I joined officially as a partner, someone went in and edited to add like the list of partners because there's like 10 of them or whatever. And someone else came in and deleted it and said, we don't need a full list. We like, <laughs> why not? It's like 10 people, right? Like, when, like, like what is so non-encyclopedic about having an, an actual list of partners? But that's just the, somehow there's this weird culture that just wants to erase the information. So I would love to see a competitor to Wikipedia. And I see no problem with it being, being privately, um, Privately run, but there and there are things that people can do to to help with this question of like, is it in the common good? Um, and part of that is just like open source. Like we have funded a number of open source companies that are that are making their software open source or at least partially open source. Um, I can't remember which ones are public, so I don't want to say because we about half our companies haven't been publicly disclosed. But we have some pretty um, pretty substantial non uh, and pretty substantial open source projects. Where, where are their fundings? I mean, how, how do they fund themselves? How do the, the open source projects yeah. fund themselves? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, typically, there, there's a number of these open source companies out there, right, where yeah. you, you yeah. make the money um, through some sort of support mechanism or by having um, a lot of times like a dual, a dual fork thing, like MySQL is open source, and they released one part of it, um, GPL, but then if you want, I don't know what, the commercial thing, you've got to give them money. So there's, there's a, a number of established models. None of them have, have grown to be $100 billion companies yet, but um, hopefully some of them will. Uh, I think the other thing that you see sometimes is that maybe some version of it is open source, and then there's maybe a server-side component, like if there's a service element to it. Um, MongoDB itself is a company, TenGen, here in Palo Alto, that's product is open source. So um, if money isn't the only motivation, can you characterize what other motivations would be? So if money isn't I mean, the only you motivation. Said that's wonderful. Oh, I, yeah. I mean, I, I, ideally, money is, is not the primary motivation. I think the people who change the world are, they have some vision of something they want to create, right? And the, the money is an enabler. You need to have the money or else you can't pay people. You can't, you can't operate in the market. But the, the things that people want to create, like I, I don't think that Google was started because Larry and Sergey wanted money. So does the vision come from Y Combinator or from the founders? Well, it comes from, it has to be something that the founders feel themselves. Uh, we do work with people a lot of times because they'll come in maybe with a bad idea or they say they have no idea. And the thing that we find is that typically if you really talk to them for a while, they actually have a lot of ideas. So there really is no such thing as someone who has no idea. Usually people who are creative and inventive enough to actually start a company are full of ideas and they just need help. Um, sorting the good ideas from the bad ideas. So it's not really so much that we give them an idea, it's more like we help them discover the idea that they already have. Because it, ha it has to be something that they're going to believe in. 
like startups are really, if you're successful, it's a long slog, you know, five years, ten years, like the rest of your life perhaps, right? I mean, like Steve Jobs worked on Apple for his whole life, more or less, I mean, except for the part where he didn't. But up, <laughs> up to the end, up to the end, right? Like, like he was there working and you look at someone like that and it's clear that it wasn't just about money, right? And you, I mean, you have billions of dollars in a death sentence and you keep working, it isn't about the money. It's about wanting to create something amazing. And those are the best entrepreneurs because those are the people who are just going to keep pushing through no matter what. Even if, even if like the whole thing is falling apart, the, those are the people who are going to be unstoppable or the ones who really believe in the vision. Uh, so going back to the no idea uh, uh, that was talked about, Y Combinator during the cycle decided to uh, have people apply who had zero idea uh, coming into the application. What percentage of this current cycle came from that group? So what percentage came from the no idea track? It's pretty small. I think I think we might have five out of eighty coming in with no idea, but um, from the no idea track, <laughs> inevitably, like a pretty substantial fraction of the companies that came in with an idea will end up changing changing direction midway through. Um, what had higher? What, what was the higher yield? The no idea track or the other track? Uh, oh, which percentage did we accept? Probably we accepted a greater percentage of the people who came in with an idea, but I don't, I, I, I didn't actually look oh. at the numbers to see if that's the case. But again, usually like people um, have ideas, and so a lot of times it's just a matter of whether they applied with their idea that, or, or not. Um, but again, we're looking for the founders. But I think there is ultimately a little bit higher bar for the no idea because, um, you know, there's got to be. <laughs> But certainly can't come in with, with a quoted or even a mock-up. Well, what it's we actually mock up, no idea. Yeah. Well, what we have them do is we tell them to just build something. So, so when they when we've accepted them for an interview, there's a period of a couple of weeks, and we say just build something. Um, and in, in fact, in one of the cases, what they built turned out to be a pretty good idea. So that's that's their idea is is it essentially stimulated them because we just said, well, just build something, and then what they built was pretty cool. So. <coughs> I'm curious what role you see crowdfunding playing uh, in startup investment, particularly in light of the new bills. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Kickstarter earlier, but they have been very public in saying that they want to fund creative projects and art-related ones, and they've actually rejected a lot of startups that wanted to raise merely for a startup. Right. But when it comes to product design, there's been a lot of products coming out of Kickstarter, but that's not necessarily the same as startup investment. So what is my view of crowdfunding? Um, I think crowdfunding is good when it's like Kickstarter, where they're actually funding the product, um, and, and what the people are getting is the product. I'm really skeptical of the crowdfunding as an investment. I think um, the economics of startups are so counterintuitive that most people have this idea that when you invest in something that you'll get the money back. <laughs> and I think that a lot of people who aren't used to the idea of investing and then not getting your money back are going to be um, disappointed. But granted, if everyone's only contributing, say, $50 each, $50 isn't as much to lose as, say, $10,000. Yeah, but I mean, if you're going to raise a few million dollars, $50 at a time, who knows? I mean, <laughs> we'll see. That's a, that's, a, that's a very large number of shareholders. Uh, and who knows? I mean, that, that could be, maybe that is the right model, where people are only investing $50. My, my fear is that people will see something and they'll invest a significant amount of their money. Um, and generally speaking, with startups, my advice is never invest money that you will mind losing because you should expect to lose it. Um, and the people who are successful in this, you just necessarily have to make a lot of investments. You can't, you can't make one or two investments and expect a return. It's just too uncertain. You have to make a large number of investments, and you have to be comfortable with losing the money. So. Mm -hmm. I've come across a few YC companies that filled out the application, got into YC, and then another founder kind of came on board later. And yeah. that founder jumped on board, was part of the team, was kind of been barred from going to some of the dinners or the demo day or some different events. So I was wondering, um, obviously you guys want to make sure that no one's just jumping into YC to jump on the team for that reason. But if you have um, a stake in the company and this person's joining the company and the founders see value in this new founder coming on board, why wouldn't you want to help them and introduce them to contacts and allow them to grow along with the company? So the question is, why wouldn't we allow new founders to be part of YC? Well, I, I, there's still, they, if someone joins the company after the company's yeah. already got into YC, uh -huh. um, I've heard that they can't come to all the events that are associated with the initial founders that are on the application. 
That's that's not accurate. We, we a lot of times the founders get added part way through. The thing that we do want to avoid is a lot of times people add employees and they say, oh, he's a founder. Well, how much does he own? No, two percent, right? You're not a founder if you own two percent of the company. So, and the reason that we want to avoid that is just that we need to limit the size of the events. You know, if a company has like ten people at the dinner, it starts to get it starts to dilute what it is. But if someone is truly like an equal founder, they'll they'll be invited. Um, that said, we do like to talk to the founders a lot of times. Um, the other thing that we've noticed is in that scenario where someone adds a founder um, after they'd accepted to YC, in uh, nearly 100% of the cases that founder ends up leaving later on. Uh, it, yeah, the people who get tacked on later on, it, it, for whatever reason, that person usually doesn't last very long. So it's kind of a weird scenario and it's just something where we want to try to keep people from shooting themselves in the foot too badly. Yeah, um, you mentioned big companies being sort of toxic for entrepreneurship. What do you think about grad school? So big companies are toxic. <laughs> what about grad school? Uh, grad school seems to be a lot better. I mean, there, there's certainly historical evidence of some pretty substantial companies coming out of grad school. So, uh, there's a big difference between getting a master's degree and a PhD, too. Yeah, I mean, whatever it is about grad school seems to be a lot more like a startup than a big company is. I think, especially people in a PhD program, they're working on a fairly independent project. Um, they have advisors, but ultimately they're responsible for making it happen on their own. So, I, and they, um, I think the other thing that's really great about grad school is it seems to be a place where people meet co-founders. Because that's a lot of times the biggest issue people have is they want to start a company or they have some idea, but they don't have a great co-founder. Um, and again, that's another problem where if you're at a big company, you're going to meet big company people who aren't great co-founders. So the thing I tell people who want to start a company but aren't ready or don't have a co-founder is to go work at a, a startup at least. Uh, because at a startup they'll meet other people who are, who are startup people and very likely to be um, potentially good co-founders. But yeah, grad school, I mean, <laughs> you can't argue with the success of, of like just the number of, of the companies in Silicon Valley that have come out of the Stanford Computer Science PhD program is astounding. But isn't it important not to finish? <laughs> <laughs> Presumably. I mean, I think, I think, uh, not all of them finish. Not all the of them famous finish. examples. Yeah, there's some famous, there. famous examples. Well, I, I think what it is is they get to the point where when you have the idea that's so good that you that it sort of burns a hole in your in your life uh, to to escape from from grad school or whatever else, then that's when you know it's good. So. Mm -hmm. Why do you think co-founders are so important? So why are co-founders so important? Um, I think the reason is that starting a startup is really hard. And uh, in particular, there's a lot of lows. Like everyone who has a successful company at some point is just really not successful. <laughs> and it's, I think, can be very lonely. Um, and at least if you have two people, hopefully they're, they're, they're like cycles of of being like, oh, this is a disaster, it's never going to work, are, are not totally synchronized. <laughs> so, so when one is feeling down, the other one can tune them up. Yeah. Uh, and, and then also, it's just a lot of work. So it, it's very helpful to have a second person. Uh, a lot of times, like, if you're doing fundraising, that can be incredibly distracting. But at least if you have two co-founders, one of them can go off and do the fundraising while the other one stays focused on the product. Um, I mean, there are certainly examples of single founder companies that succeed, but uh, really, I think the psychological burden and the emotional burden of starting a company is, is greater than people realize. And that's also part of the reason that we encourage people to stay in Silicon Valley. Um, when you go someplace else that's not Silicon Valley or maybe New York, it's very difficult because you're in that low spot and everyone around you is just like, why don't you get a real job? <laughs> right? Or they're just alone, which is even worse. You know, I mean, someone's holed up in an apartment someplace far away. Um, you know, humans are, are social creatures. We need to interact with each other. So it's really important that they have essentially a supportive community. You said that you're looking to fund $100 billion companies. And most VCs have the typical question, how do you get to a billion dollars? But if you're funding the kind of a multiple of that, and the top two companies create all the value out of the 200, what do you think of the rest of them? What happens to the rest of them? Are they considered failures, or like the companies that sell too early, or or don't get an exit. So what do we think of the companies that aren't $100 billion <laughs> companies? We still like them. Um, 
And, and for a couple of reasons. One is that we don't know which ones are going to be, I mean, if we actually knew which ones were going to be the $100 billion companies, we'd be tempted to only fund those. Uh, yeah. But it's surprisingly hard to tell. Um, no one really knows for sure. But the thing is, even if it's not a $100 billion company, a lot of those companies still add a lot of value to the network. So like Wufu, you know, I gave the example earlier, they sold um, last year uh, to SurveyMonkey, I forget the exact price, but you know, say 30 to 50 million or something, not, not a billion dollars, unfortunately. But it was actually still a good return for the early investors because there were only two of us. Um, and they've added a lot to the community because they're, they're very good designers, they're very good at, at um, customer service, they have a really strong culture. So um, they've, they've spoken with other YC companies, they've advised other YC companies. So they, they've added a lot to YC, not just from a financial perspective, but from a cultural perspective. And the same thing goes for like Heroku. Um, I mean, that was a great exit. That was, I think, $220 million. Um, but also those guys are just really good uh, at advising people on things like fundraising, helping people out with scaling issues. Um, they actually offer really generous credits to the YC companies to, to run their services in Heroku. So um, I, I think owing to the network of YC companies, there's a lot of there's a lot of value just in having good founders. And a lot of times those good founders would go on to create other companies. So again, like I gave the example earlier of Justin Kahn and Emmett Shear, their first company was Kiko, which got squashed like almost immediately by Google because it was a it was a web based calendar. But then they went and started another company. And now they're starting a third round of companies. Social Cam and Exec are both um, companies that, that came out of uh, Justin TV. So it's there's just value in keeping good people around, essentially. Huh? What are the uh, oldest entrepreneurs that you've funded? Hmm, who are the oldest entrepreneurs? I don't know, there's a couple of people in their 50s. I don't know, I don't think we've had anyone older than maybe mid-50s. Um, it's definitely, I mean, we're certainly open to, to older entrepreneurs, but I think realistically... Mid-50s when they started? Uh, well, mid-50s when they came into YC. Um, they'll be older later. Uh, <laughs> but I, 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 I think... <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I think age matters a lot of times, maybe not so much because of age. Age age versus physical age. Yeah, but also just situation in life. So I started, when I started FriendFeed, I was um, probably about 30, uh, which isn't that old. But uh, <laughs> the thing is, I also had kids. And it turns out that kids are very needy little things, uh, much like startups. And so now you have, instead of having like one startup, you have two startups or three startups. And they're all competing for each other. Um, competing for your time and your energy and your emotional. The parent model. Yeah, so I, mean, I, I think it's a lot of what happens is just that you accumulate other obligations in life. So, you know, when I first joined Google, I was like 22, I think. I, I graduated from college like one year prior. And, um, you know, I, I would work, let's say, from noon until 3 a.m., so maybe 15 hours a day. And it wasn't because I'm a hard worker, it's just because I thought it was fun. Right, because like at the time I thought like working 15 hours a day was just a great thing to do. I just loved going in and like hacking. Um, but now I would never do that because that would, if I was working 15 hours a day, that would be uh, mean I was neglecting my kids and my wife the rest of the time. And like just for me personally, I think that's not a great trade-off. So I think the bigger issue is just like are you able to make that that huge commitment to the that's required a lot of times to make these companies take off. Just give you 50 of kids already. Sure, maybe, maybe it'll turn out that, that, that once the kids leave is a great time to start a company too. I, I would love to see that become the trend. Um, you never know. But I think the other thing that happens again, sometimes with people who are older, is that same effect where I mentioned that I, I think being in a big company for too long kind of damages your brain. Um, so the, the question is... Other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know. <laughs> It's the, the, the evidence seems strong. So the, the problem is, you know, what have they been doing up to that point? And if it's like they've been sitting there inside of IBM grinding away on something, it's not sure. You're not really, I don't know if they're going to be ready. If they've spent that time, you know, hacking on cool stuff, they might be, they might be the ultimate entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. 
Are you guys still opposed to single founders? Um, the reason I ask is I'm in this situation where I've been working on something for a few years, and it just doesn't make sense for me right now to come bring on somebody and say, hey, you're cool, I'm going to make you a founder. Yeah. Right? I am pretty much the single founder at this point. I yeah. often have good employees, but it's you know I, I know you guys have a bias against single founders in general. Is that like a blanket thing? No, absolutely not. I mean the example I gave earlier, um, uh, Olga came up. This, she she's uh, not only a single founder, she's non-technical. Um, so we will fund anyone who who we think is going to succeed. The reason we have a little bit of a bias against single founders is just because you know it's a it makes life harder for you, but. Um, probably the best example is Drew Houston when he applied with Dropbox was a single founder. <laughs> so, so you know, it would be very unwise of us to, to have a blanket rejection of single founders. But we, in, both we, those, hmm? in both those cases, they had something going in a very short amount of time. You just said I spent several years. So you're yeah. not in the you're not in the successful single founder category. <laughs> <laughs> it's taking too long. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just not that kind of yeah. So you think you have a higher threshold than a single founder? Yeah, I mean, we're just trying to estimate your chances of success. So it's, it's just something that's going to make life harder for you if you're a single founder. But it certainly isn't. I mean, the thing that we do is we encourage them to, to find someone. Like in the case of Drew, um, he found a rash, I, I think, actually before YC started. And then with Olga, we helped find a couple of other people who are interested in joining her. Um, but we have, have a lot of single founders. It isn't. It's just, it's, just, it's, it's just that it's worse for you, really. That's the reason. But we, we certainly have accepted a lot of single founders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Out of all the things that Y Combinator uh, provides to the entrepreneurs, what is the most important in your eyes, whether it's the, the network or the money, um, or the three months of advice and teamwork within the, within the program? Which one is probably the number one factor that you would put the most value on? So the question is, what is the most valuable thing we provide? Well, it's definitely not the money. Uh, I think it probably is different for everyone. And I also mentioned, you said the advice during the three months. Why Combinator is actually a permanent thing. So we have a, it's a three-month program that's intensively focused. We have weekly dinners. We bring in speakers that you get to meet and you know help you get ready for demo day. But it continues um, forever, essentially, after that. So we still, I still do office hours with companies from years ago. Uh, we continue advising, but I, I don't know if there's any. I don't think there's any single answer because it really depends on the startup and on what the startup needs. So, as part of what makes the job very interesting to me is that everyone has different needs. Sometimes, um, sometimes it's just a simple like, you know, introducing them to the right person. Other people they need maybe a new idea. <laughs> uh, some people have great ideas. So I, I don't think there's any. I don't think there's any one answer, but. But it's clear that everyone seems to find substantial value in their own in their own way. It's whatever you need most is the best thing we provide. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, coming back to that, well, yeah, like those three companies have the same idea. What did you do at that point? Did you bring them in the room or did you keep them separate? What did we do when the three companies had the same idea? Well, we don't need to separate them because the companies don't work at Y Combinator. They just come in for dinners. Um, what happened is they just kind of diverged on their own. They went they went in different directions. Um, the two. So you did not have to do anything. Yeah. So actually, one of them that, that I'm pretty sure is public is Code Code Academy, uh, or Code Academy, <laughs> um, and they started out doing uh, programming interviews essentially, um, as did two other companies in that batch, and they pretty quickly just found that they weren't excited about that, and they kind of. But they, they, they changed direction, but it isn't completely different. Now they're teaching people to program. It's a kind of related space, but it's, um, I think, proven to be a much better space for them, at least. So, I don't know. We don't, we don't push them to change. They just seem to do it on their own. Mm -hmm. Do you have some examples of, of ideas that seem to be in the bad category at the start and then turned out to be actually the good ones? So do I have the ideas that looked like they were bad but turned out to be good? Yeah, I mean, you were saying those are the ones yes, that really Yes, yes. I think the best example would, would again be Airbnb. Because when I, when I first met them, they're like, we have this site where you can rent air beds in someone's, in someone else's house. I was like, wow, that sounds like not exciting. Um, and, and in fact, you know, I think that idea did have limited potential. Um, the real opportunity was when it was made a little bit more general, which I think was their plan all along. 
but because they had Airbed right in the name, it was very hard to see past the Airbed because every time I'd hear the company name, I'm like, I don't want to sleep on an Airbed. I hate those things, right? Uh, but no one believed in the idea. I mean, I think when they came in, they were the ones who believed, and, and that's actually, to me, a really strong signal because if you have, if you have really smart dedicated founders who seem to really genuinely believe in an idea, even when everyone tells them it's a bad idea, that to me actually is a really strong signal um, that they're either delusional or visionary. Um, and, yeah, and you never really know until later on. But, uh, you know, I, I think to get these really extreme outlier results, someone has to have very independent view, viewpoints. Um, maybe the best example of this is, is Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, right? Um, when they were about 8 million users, they launched Newsfeed, and a million users joined a group to protest the, the new feature, Newsfeed, <laughs> which is incredible. Like, getting 10% of your users to do anything is remarkable, right? But let alone have them all so engaged in the product that they protest your decision and say that they're going to leave the site and like hate it and everything is, is incredible. But what's also really remarkable about that story is that they just said, no, I think you're going to like it, right? And Facebook has a history of doing these things where everyone's like, this is the worst thing you've ever done. I'm never coming back to Facebook. I hate it. And then they're like, well, you know, <laughs> we'll see. And inevitably, somehow the people just keep coming back. Um, but I, I think that if someone, a founder with less conviction would tend to fold very quickly on a lot of those things. Because it's really scary when you have a million people telling you that your ideas are bad. <laughs> right? Not many people are like, capable of absorbing that much negative information. And especially, like, the situation now is really interesting. Like, the news is covered in these stories about how, like, Facebook is dead for some reason or, or whatever. It's, there's, like, so much negative information. And, and I think to be able to survive that much negativity requires a founder who just has real conviction and vision. Let's cut the cameras now. Uh, and All right. Now, yeah, cool stuff's going to happen.